So today I'm going to be giving some basic background on C. So this is kind of a refresher. Uh, generally, 537 has a prerequisite, which is 354, where per people learn a lot of basics uh, about C. But I know a lot of people in um, at least my section have not taken that course. So I'm going to try to give this as a crash course so you can get up to speed quickly. Now, of course, what you should really be doing if you don't know C, but you still want to take the courses, you should be buying this book by uh, Kurt Ahad and Richie, the K&R book and reading it, it's pretty short. Uh, but I know I have a lot of students who have ordered this and it's in the mail or they're still reading through it. So I'm going to try to just give a very brief background on a variety of tricky C topics. So really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to try to help people who um, are strong programmers in other languages but are, are new to a C or C++ kind of programming languages. So here is a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to look at pointers and arrays, structures, function pointers, how the preprocessor works, how to build projects with multiple files, and finally, how to debug your programs with GDB. Okay, so first, let's head over to a simple main program here. Uh, this should just print hello world. So I'm going to compile this, and I'm going to say warn all, so it will let me know if I do anything weird. And so I want my output to be made, and I might want to compile main.c. So so far, so good. So let me run that, and sure enough, hello world. Okay, so let's, what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up complexity and, and do a number of different examples. I'm going to be giving bad examples as well as good examples so that you can see what you shouldn't do. And another approach uh, or benefit of me taking this approach to teaching is that when I do screw up, I'll just use it as a, an example of what not to do. So here we're printing off a string with printf. So what I'm going to do is to make this slightly more complicated is I'm going to put this in an array, a string array that's on the stack. So I'm going to say hello world here. And then when I want to print this out, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say percent %f. So I want to print a string and then I'm going to say what the message is. So let me build this again and run it. And sure enough, it's still hello world. So now I'm going to give, that was a good example. Now I'm going to give you a bad example. <coughs> a very common mistake I see people making is that they will not use a string template in the percent f. So they'll just say print f of your message. So let's try that. And it's warning me that it's bad. But when I run it, it actually works. So, so why is this a bad thing to do? It's bad because when I, I take this string in like this, maybe this string came from some user input somewhere. So for example, what could a malicious user do? Maybe in here they use some, some template like that. So what will happen when you run this? Well, printf is going to look in this message and see a percent %s, which came from some untrusted user. And it's going to look and try to find that, that string on the stack, which, of course, it's not there. And we'll get some bad output, as you see here. Hello world, followed by a bunch of garbage. Okay, so we don't want to do that. What we really want to do is um, always use the percent %s as so. Okay, so far so good. So... Now I'm going to talk some more about uh, uh, strings and their sizes, both when we're dealing with arrays, as, as in this case, and also when we're <coughs> dealing with pointers to strings. So uh, arrays and pointers have a lot in common, and I'm going to kind of show you how they're similar and also how they're different. So first what I want to do here is I want to get a string that is exactly 10 characters long. So I have that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at it, its size in a, in a few different ways. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print f uh, the str length of the string. So as so, and str length message. And I'll, I'll actually just compile this before I do anything else even. So I'm going to compile that. And you see it's complaining here that actually str length is not defined. That's because it's in a header file. So I'm going to look in my man pages for str length, and very good. And this will very conveniently tell me this header file that I need to include for this to work properly. Okay, so so far so good. Let me rebuild this, and I can run it. And it says str length is 10, as expected. 
I have the 10 characters here. Now there's other ways I could reason about the size of this array. So I'm going to show you some other ones. Maybe some of you are familiar with uh, the size of expression in C. So I can do this as so. And this is actually going to give a slightly, slightly different answer. So let me run this again. And I see that now I get 11. So what's, what's going on here? So the actual length here is 10 characters, but when I do size of, <clears throat> I'm looking at the size of the whole array, and every, every uh, char array should be uh, ended with uh, a zero character. That's how you know that's the end of the string. Otherwise, you could run right off the end of the string and print, print all kinds of things you don't even want. Okay, so that's a little bit tricky. Let's, let's make it even trickier. So this message here acts a lot like a pointer. So what I can do is I can say, I'm going to have a pointer called uh, PTR, and I can say PTR equals message, and I want to look at the size of that. And I, actually, I can really shorten this code here to just say message on this same line. Okay, so now I'm going to add a size of PTR, right? So I'm going to actually put this back to just make the example extra clear for those who are not super familiar with pointers yet. Okay, so pointer, it looks like pointer and message should be the same. So intuitively, I bet you're thinking that the size of message will be the same as size of pointer. So let's see if, if your intuition is correct. <coughs> and we see that no, it is not. We have yet a third answer for the size of our string. How do we get eight? Well, eight times eight is 64, and we're on a 64-bit machine. So all pointers, all pointers in a 64-bit machine are going to be 8 bytes, just like this, whether it's a, an integer pointer, a char pointer, or a pointer to a struct, it doesn't matter. It's always going to be 8 since we're on a 64-bit machine. So now you can see that this is confusing, right? We can say that the, the pointer and the ray, they're, they're basically pointing to the same thing, but still the message, which is the ray, is fundamentally different than the pointer because the size of acts differently on it. Let me give you another example of how these things, even though they're both very pointer-like, are slightly different. So I said pointer equals array. I should also be able to say message equals pointer. You might intuitively think that this will work. So I'm going to run again. And now I see that my compiler is not happy because um, basically the thing on the left side is a char array, and that is not assignable. So generally you can use these, uh, these arrays where you would be using a pointer, but there's a few cases where the behavior will be somewhat different. Okay, so there's a number of other uh, ways we can deal with strings. So I'm going to go back to just printing off what the string is. I don't really want this message anymore. I'm going to print it off just like that. So I'm going to say message and do that. And um, instead of having it just determine the size, one thing I can do is I can tell it an initial size is so. And I'll just say hello for now. And if I compile that, that will be fine. Um, other things I could do, so now when I'm actually specifying the size, it will be unhappy if it's too long since I'm, I'm specifying. And you can see that, that there will, will be a warning here. And then if I print it, I'll end up with some garbage because it's not large enough. Okay, so it seems like this is less convenient specifying the size beforehand. So why would I want to do that? One reason is that I might not be able to have a simple string constant like this when I'm initializing it. So for example, one way <coughs> I might want to initialize this message is with something called sprintf. Printf is a lot like, sprintf is a lot like printf except that it's printing to a string. So here what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna print to message and then, so basically I'm gonna take the arguments I normally would before, but I'm gonna take as, as the initial one, I'm gonna have a pointer to to my string, which in this case is just message. And so I can say 5 plus 3 equals percent D, and I'm going to have it do math for me. And then I can actually say well, over here 5 plus 3. So I'm, I'm constructing a more complex string on the fly. So that's why I have to give it a size, since it won't be obvious to the compiler how large this is going to be. OK, so I'm going to run that again. And I see that the message is 5 plus 3 equals 8. Okay, so that's good. There are some ca caveats about how you do this sprintf. 
In particular, what happens if we try to print a really long string to it? I could end up with some trouble. So I'm going to end up printing 20 A's here and see what happens. And I see that it aborts because basically I'm overflowing that string. So a better version <coughs> of S printf is actually S n printf, where I tell it the maximum maximum size of this message. So in this case, I can say size of message, which will be 10, and then print that to that. So then uh, my printf shouldn't do anything bad. Um, and actually, let me shorten this a little bit here so you can see see what's going on. I'm going to say this is of size 4. I'm going to print all these A's again. So run that. And I see I actually get three A's <coughs> because sprintf is, is, again, remember it has to end every string with a 0, and that's what it's using the fourth fourth character for. All right, so let's let's talk some more about pointers. We've, we've kind of looked a little bit at the differences between uh, between arrays and pointers and their similarities. Um, what I'm going to do now is instead of having oh, this message originate in main, I'm going to have it originate in another function that's called get message. So get message is going to return a char pointer because I want to return a string, and it won't take any arguments for now. Um, <clears throat> and what I'm going to do is this is going to be another example of bad code. I'm going to say this message equals hello world. Okay. So, and actually I don't need that new line there since I have it below. And I'm going to return message. So, so let me run that. And we see that we're getting some warnings here. Uh, one of which is because I didn't call get message. I was just using an old variable name. Let me recompile this. Now we only have a warning. Address of stack variable. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to live on the edge and ignore that warning and try running this program. And I see that my message actually gets garbled. It's not really what I would expect. Um, and so you might think, oh, if I just listen to these warnings, I don't have to run into any problem. Uh, but you do have to still be careful. So let me give you an example of why you have to be careful. If you pass these, these pointers around, say like this, and I return message to, it might compile, and then I run it, I still get some garbage here. It, nothing is showing up. So something is very strange going on. What's happening is that this code down here is calling get message, so we're creating a new stack frame for this. And that's where all of this data is allocated. So as soon as get message returns, I can't count on this address being valid anymore. We aren't in the stack frame. It's, it's almost as if we freed the stack frame. So just like if you malloc something and then free it, you can't use pointers to that area anymore. In the same case, as, in the same way, as soon as we return from get message, we can't use this reference anymore. So what would be a better way to do this? One way to do it is we want to <coughs> uh, put this message on the heap, because if it's on the heap, it will persist and won't go away when the stack frame returns. One function that will allocate space for a string on the heap and copy to it is called stir dupe. So here I'm going to call stir dupe, and that will malloc some space and then return it down here. So let me let me give this a try. I run it, and sure enough, now now I'm actually getting the message that I wanted. Okay, and of course, uh, being the good programmer that I am, what I really want to do is when I'm done with this message, I should actually free it. So I'm going to put this here. Uh, my message, and then when I'm all done, I should actually free this message since it's been allocated. Okay, so let me run this again, and sure enough, it, it doesn't change the behavior, but now I've, I've freed up my memory that I was using. Okay, so how does this stir dupe work? It's going to malloc some space and then copy, so I'm just going to, as an exercise, uh, write this function as a demonstration. So I'm going to have something here that says, uh, I'm going to call it my dupe. And what I want to do is I want to take a pointer to an original string, and I want to allocate some space on the heap for it, and then return that. Okay, so first things first, I want to have my new string. I'm going to malloc some space. And uh, how large do I need to make this? I want this new string to be just as large as this one up here. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say str length of original, but this actually isn't quite correct. So I want you to think for a moment about what might be wrong here. So the problem is that when we're mallocking this space, we not only need to have space for every character in the string, we also need space for, for the zero character at the end. So I am going to add that. So now I have some space. And a good thing to do is when you are mallocking space, it's possible malloc could return an error. Why? Maybe there's no more memory on the machine to allocate to this process. I'm going to assert that new is not equal to null. And ultimately what I'm going to do at the end is I'm going to return new. So in here I need to copy this original string over to the new string. So for that purpose I'm going to do a mem copy. And in mem copy what we really do is we say the destination first and then the source and then the size. So in this case, the destination is new, the source is a ridge, and the size is, is it this? That's almost right, but once again, we also want to copy over that zero character. So I'm going to do this as so. And now I actually want to use my dupe instead of stir dupe. And hopefully if I wrote this code correctly, we should do the same behavior. Uh, unfortunately, I'm getting a couple of warnings here because I, I'm using a cert which uh, I haven't included. So let me look at the man page for assert. I see that I have to include assert.h. I'm going to copy this code from the man page as so, and compile again. And now it's happy. So now let's see if this works. And sure enough, it works as before. OK, so this should all be good so far. And of course, if this assert fails, what is my program going to do? It's going to immediately crash. So at least I won't continue on and have bizarre behavior. I'll know where my problem is. When it crashes, it will print off this line number here. Now let's say I want to write a program that handles malloc failures in a more reasonable way. And, and, and in particular, I want it to return some error uh, when it malloc fails. Okay, so I'm going to have to get rid of this assert and do error handling another way. One way that people commonly do, uh, one way that people commonly do error handling is that they will return an integer that will be zero upon success and one upon failure. So, on success, one on failure. Okay. But now that's too bad because I was actually returning, I wanted to return this string before. So what I have to do, I'm ultimately trying to return two things, right? I want to return, I want to return my new string and I also want to return an error. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take another argument and I'm, I'm giving the bad example again for now. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll, I'll demonstrate why this is bad and then I'll fix it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try on successfully to set this variable that's coming in to this new string and then hopefully hopefully we can modify it in the original calling function. So now I'm going to get rid of this and I'm going to say um, if new equals null then I'm going to return 1 which was my failure otherwise I will return 0 if everything is good. Okay so let me run this and of course, now I'm taking two arguments up here, so I should better check this and get message. Uh, so what I want to do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna first take the return value and that's gonna be this my dupe. And actually, I'm gonna say RC for my return code. And uh, I'm gonna also have a new variable down here. So ultimately I'm gonna be returning new. So let me create some space for that. So I have this, this pointer here that I'm going to initialize. And what I want to do is I want to check this return code. And if the return code, say, is not equal to zero, I'm going to try to initialize it some other way. So now I'm going to say new equals um, I should malloc some space for this. I'm just going to use the original stir dupe. OK, 
Okay, and we're just going to ignore errors for this for now. Okay, so let's think about this. So I have new, and what I'm hoping it's going to do is that when I call my dupe, it's trying to populate new. But that's not going to work. Remember, this is the is the broken example. So hopefully, you're already thinking about what about this is broken. I'm going to run this. And where is it it's saying that? So actually, my compiler is very kindly notifying me that this is uninitialized. Okay, I was hoping that my dupe would initialize it, but indeed it's not. So, so why am I doing it this way? I'm ultimately doing it this way to show you why it might be useful to have a double pointer. Right now when I'm passing in new like this, there's no way for my dupe to make new point to something else because uh, passing it in C is all passed by value. So Perhaps I could modify in my dupe something that this points to, but I can't make it point to something new itself. So what I really have to do if I want my dupe to modify the new to make it point to something else, I have to go up here and I have to have a double pointer. Okay? And then what I can do is I can, when I do it like this, I can make, and I should actually probably rename this, I'm going to call it new pointer. Okay, so now I'm updating the pointer set it points to something new. And then I have to do this down here too. Okay, so I'm, I'm dereferencing it to one level. So I'm ultimately going to make this point to something new. And of course down here, to make this a double pointer then as well, I have to take the address of that. Okay, so I'm passing the address of this pointer up here, which lets my dupe make that pointer point to something new. Okay? So let's try this. Let's see if I missed anything. Oh, uh, and... Where did I have that mistake? And what I really had here is I need to use the new pointer everywhere. Okay, and let's run this again. And sure enough, it's still working. Okay, so this is the kind of case where you might often see double pointers. We don't we want to return a pointer, but we can't because we have a return code here. So we want to modify an argument that's not the return value. And of course we can only do that by adding another another layer of pointers <clears throat> because everything's passed by reference. Okay, so hopefully that, that makes sense. So this, this code over here is the way you'd want to do this now. And, and of course, I, I'm kind of uh, skipping over parts of the example because when I, I do this stir dupe on this failure, I should really be checking the failure of stir dupe too. But I'm not doing that now, just in this example. Okay, so let me now look at some very simple string comparison things. What I'm going to do is I'm going to come down here and I'm going to get the message twice. Now I'm going to free message one. And I'm also going to get a second message, message two. So there's some free going down there. I have my two messages. And what I want to say is whether or not these two things equal each other. So I'm going to say percent %s does this equal the other percent s and then I'm going to say a yes or no. So the yes or no is also going to be a percent s. So what arguments do I have here? I have the message 1, message 2, and then what I ultimately want to do is I'm going to say if these two things are equal I want to say yes otherwise no. So I'm going to use the c try conditional which looks like this. Message 2. If that's true I'm going to return yes otherwise no. Okay, so let's try running this. And does hello world equal hello world? No. Let me add some quotes around this to make this even more clear. Okay, so this is very strange, right? It looks like these two strings are the same, but it's actually saying they're not equal. So what's going on here? Let me print some out some more details. So I'm going to say the string at, and I want to print out a pointer now, so I'm going to put that pointer is percent %s. And then both times I want to print both the contents of that string and the pointer of the string. So I'm going to do that for message 1 and also for message 2. Okay, and what I see is happening here is that these strings are slightly different addresses. 
I, I was having trouble seeing the difference there for the moment. So even though they have the same contents, they're they're sort of different contents. So indeed, these strings are not are not the same. Okay, what I could do is if I there's a couple of ways I could reason about this. I could say if stir comp of a and of, of message one and message two. I'm actually going to go down to the new line here. So if stir comp is going to return one if they're different. So I should actually change this to yes and zero if if they're the same. So let me run this again. <coughs> and stir comp actually does what I want to do. Instead of just comparing the pointers, it compares the char the the strings one character at a time. Uh, let me actually go back briefly to the other way I had this, which was like this. So now I'm comparing the pointers again. If, if I say do something like this, then I actually would see that the pointers are the same as well. So let me compile that. And I see that um, I actually wanted to save my, my, let me, that's what I was looking for. Well, I actually want to print off these pointers as well, so let me compile this again. And I see that now, indeed, the pointers are actually the same. So one thing also that I'm seeing people get tripped up on is when you have these, these two different um, pointers pointing to the same array of characters. When you modify one, the other is also going to be modified, of course. And, and people are sometimes getting tripped up on that. So let me just, in this case, so I'm, I'm going to get rid of this comparison because I'm demonstrating something else now. Um, I'm going to print these before then print these after. Let's say I do something like I modify message one, and I may modify the first character of it to equal to J. Let me run that. I see that when I modify one string, they both get modified because they're both pointing to the same space. So don't get it tripped up by the pointers. Okay, so that was the first thing on our agenda that I wanted to talk about, arrays and pointers. So now let's take a look at some structs. So I'm going to get rid of all this code here. And <clears throat> structs are, are a lot like, say, classes, except they don't have, have uh, methods associated with them. So they just have all the member variables, all of which are, are public. So let's define a struct called chord, and we have to end our struct with a semicolon here, and we can have some members inside of it, again, separated by semicolons. Okay, so let's create a struct here, um, an instance of this struct. So I, I might try something like this, um, and hopefully you can tell me what's wrong with this. I'm going to try to initialize a couple variables. So let me try compiling this, and we actually see this confusing message, must use struct tag to refer to the type chord. So basically what it's telling you over here is that the name of this struct is not just chord, the full name is struct chord. So I'm going to use struct chord like this, and now of course it's happy. Okay, so that gets annoying, people don't like typing this out all the time, so what they're going to do is they're going to give it a nickname. Uh, with a special C feature called the type def. The type def basically says, you say type def, and then you say the name, and then you say the nickname, just like that. Okay, so in this case, what I want to do is I want to rename chord, and I could actually just call it chord if I wanted to. And, and then now once I have this, I can get rid of this struct here. So let me try that, and sure enough, it works. And I should probably actually be printing these things out here uh, so we can actually see that things are working. Uh, so I'm going to say chord, uh, and we'll take a, I guess for now let's just do it like this, and we'll print out what the x and y is. Actually, I should print this down here. Okay, so let me run that. And it's actually unhappy here. Why is it unhappy? Invalid for um, conversion. 
And it's not happy because I had a percent Y there. I just had an extra character. Okay, so let me try running this. And sure enough, uh, print cord works as it's supposed to. Um, now this this is kind of uh, one way people use type defs. What's, what's more common is that they want to indicate that it's it's a type, so they'll often say underscore T. So let me update that. Just This is not so much a thing of C, but just a pattern you'll often see in C code. So I can do that here, so that people know that's a struct. And I'm going to keep showing you some variants on this. That's still working. <coughs> Often, you'll see people combining this. So when I say struct chord here, it's almost like this whole thing. So what I could really do is I could put this whole thing here and ultimately combine the type def with the struct. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to get rid of this extra line down here by saying type def, and then down here saying chord t. Okay, and now I can get rid of that line, so see that it still works. And now really, um, I mean, I could use either struct chord or chord underscore t, uh, but since I'm never really going to use chord, I could even go a step further and delete that, and of course it'll still work. Um, so we're in pretty good shape here. Okay, so that's uh, a brief lesson on type defs for structures. We'll look at more type defs later when it comes to function pointers. <clears throat> Let me um, now take a look at something called pointer dereference. Okay, so often people won't be passing around a whole struct like this. Why? Maybe this struct has hundreds of things in it, and I'm copying a lot of memory on the stack. So what's more often that people will do is they'll take a pointer to the instance of their struct. And let me let me try running this, and it's going to give me some errors. So lots of things it's unhappy about member reference type. So the first thing it's unhappy about is that C is a pointer, but I'm, I'm trying to look up a member of it. What I have to do is I have to follow that pointer to the actual struct before I try accessing a member of it. So to do that, I have to say star C. So now I'm following that pointer to the thing I want and then looking inside the members. So let me try that. So that fixed some of my problems. And then down here, of course, I'm trying to pass it the actual, actual struct, but I want to get a pointer to that struct. So now I'm going to take dereference. I'm going to take the reference to it. Okay. So I'm going to run that and then show that sure enough, it still works. Now, you would end up writing a lot of code that looks like this, where you um, where you follow a reference and then look up a member, and that's very convenient. So in C, there's actually a shorthand. I'm going to demonstrate that with just one of these variables, but not the other. You can say instead of doing the star and then a dot, you can just say an arrow. So that, that will dereference and look at the member at the same time. Okay, so I'm going to do that, and of course it still works. So that's basically the gist of how you can uh, write structures and have pointers to structures and then um, also dereference members. So hopefully that makes sense. <coughs> so let's move on now to the next item on our agenda. We've covered pointers and arrays, we've covered structs. Let's talk about function pointers. Okay, so function pointers are useful, especially in C, because uh, C is not object-oriented. You can imagine um, in other languages you might have a class and inheritance, and, and there might be different ways to implement the members of that class, or, or perhaps an interface, uh, and different functions or methods could handle a given interface in different ways. The, people, the way people implement interfaces in C is that they have function pointers, and then those function pointers could point to different implementations of that general function. Okay, so let's have a simple case here where we have some functions that do addition and multiplication. So I'm going to have an add function, and y, and actually I'm going to just hang, uh, hang on to my struct for a while. Um, <clears throat> I'll just say instead of adding these x and y, I'm going to take a, a t and add the elements of it, or a chord, a chord t and add the elements of it. So I'm going to say I have my chord here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return x plus y. Okay, and I'm also going to have a version that does multiplication. Okay, let me just make sure that these are working first. So I'm going to have my chord t chord down here. Chord.x equals 3, uh, chord.y equals 5, and then let me print both of these out. OK, 
Okay, so hopefully when we add, we'll get 8, and when we multiply, we'll get 15. And that was slightly wrong because multiplication is broken. So I'm going to do a mult there, try again, and sure enough, we get what we expect. <clears throat> okay, so let's find a way to generalize this now. Because there's a lot of similarity between, between these two functions. So what we want to do is we want to, <coughs> just for the sake of using a function pointer, I'm going to have something called do, do op. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the chord, and then I also want to say, uh, here I'm going to say whatever the op type is. Uh, or I'll, say, I'll take a pointer to the op function. Right, so it's a little tricky figuring out how to specify this type for a given function. So you can see that these, uh, um, these, these functions look very similar. So the way I can pull out the type is I'm going to just grab one of these, here, and I'm going to say no pointer type. What I can do if I want to get rid of get just get the type, I'm going to get rid of these names here, and I'm going to put parentheses around the name and put a star before it, and I'm going to also give it something else. It's not just multiply b um, addition. Okay, so this here is the type that takes a pointer to a chord and then returns an integer. So what I want to do here is I'm going to specify that. And now what will happen is that this fn will be will be a function pointer. So just remember, like functions are just in memory somewhere, so they have addresses like anything else, and we can call them like we would any other function. Okay, so what do I'm trying to do is it's trying to return this function and it's trying to pass that chord to it. Okay, so let me let me get rid of these things. Well, I guess I'll run this again and make sure I haven't broken anything. So still good. So now <clears throat> what I could do is I could call these things. I could say do op and I'm passing it my chord again and I can say what type of operation I want to do. So I could say I want to do addition or maybe down here I want to do uh, multiplication. So and let's try this and make sure it still works. And sure enough, it still works. Okay, so what we're doing is we're taking um, these addresses of these functions and we're passing these addresses to doop and then doop uses that address to call the function. So hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, well, uh, what else do I want to talk about here? Let me, let me actually, uh, this is not really related to function pointers, so let me talk about what we might do <coughs> if I wanted my main function to be first. So I put this maybe up at the top and try compiling this again. And I get a lot of errors about, uh, or warnings about implicit declarations. And that's because when I'm writing a C function, it only looks up before it for uh, the, the definition of those functions. So main is trying to look up above here for the definition of, say, do op or add. So the way you get around that trick, well, one way is that I could put main last like it was before, uh, but there are cases where that won't work. For example, if I have a uh, recursion where two functions are calling back and forth to each other, I can't put them both first. One of them has to come later. So the way we get around that <clears throat> is we do something called a function prototype where we don't define the whole function, but we just define kind of the header of it like, like so. And I can do that for all my functions. And then this will make main happy because even though add and malt haven't been defined yet, it knows that they will be later and it knows how they'll be defined. And actually I should get rid of this down here. Um, so I think I have one left to do. Uh, yep, do op, I need to have do op defined up here with the rest. Okay. So let me compile that and see, sure enough, it still is still working again. Okay, so we're cruising along here. Um, let me head back to my agenda. We've talked about three of these things now, function pointers as well. Uh, let's, let's take a look at some preprocessor stuff. Some, sometimes this can be a little bit <coughs> a little bit tricky. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to save this in a backup in case I want to borrow this code later, but I'm going to delete all of this for now, uh, except my main. I want that. 
And what I want to do is I want to have a function called megabytes to bytes. And this is going to take a number of megabytes and then return how many bytes that is. Okay, so I'm ready to return MB. And I want to somewhere have the number of uh, num of bytes per megabyte. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna define this somewhere else. Uh, I'm gonna define this up here in, in something called a macro. So let me let me create a macro here. You've probably seen these before. We can just say define, <coughs> and then this will end up looking something like name and then value. So in this case, I'm gonna call my macro megabytes. Okay, and I'm going to have the value be 1024 times 1024, right? Because there's 1024 kilobytes in a megabyte. Okay, so what I can do to up here now is I can just divide, uh, actually multiply MB times, times this number up here. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at this. And this is actually, again, a broken example. And I'll show you why. So I'm going to say 2 megabytes is percent D. Actually, let's just do one first. And I'm going to say megabytes two bytes of one. And I'm going to try it with two. Like this. So, okay, so let's give this a try and run this. And um, Actually, this is kind of a bad example for what I was doing. I guess you do see that uh, that this is doing what you might expect. It's working correctly. It's doing the conversion. Um, <clears throat> uh, one case where this will not work is let's say mm, let's say for some reason I was doing something funky like it, this is also true. I could also say that megabytes equals that. Um, I could say zero plus that or something like that, and I might expect this to work the same way, but it actually won't. Now I get the same answer for each time, which is very strange, right? Because I'm expecting that this whole thing down here will be replaced here, and then I'm just going to multiply whatever value I have times the 1048576. So why is this getting the value, same value each time? It's because these preprocessors that go through my code beforehand and replace this with this are, are, are just basically doing a very simple copy and replace. They aren't reasoning about uh, operation precedence. So let me, let me show you how this works. So whenever you're dealing with something tricky with the preprocessor, there's a nice little way to use GCC that handles that. And in particular, what you can do is you can say GCC-E-P and say what your code is. And this will basically run the preprocessor on here and show me all the replacements. And I see what's happening here is that it basically did exactly what it's supposed to. It replaced MB, capital MB, with this string here. So what's happening is that it'll first do MB times zero, which is of course always zero, and then just return this. So what I really want to do is whenever I have a preprocessor macro like this, I should put the number in, in parentheses to avoid that kind of problem. So if I run this again now, and I come up and I see this, this has changed, and of course that will fix my problem. So I should actually compile that code as so, and then show, sure enough, it, it is again working because I have my parentheses there. Okay, so I think that's good. We've talked about functions um, and some stuff with macros. So now let's go back to another <coughs> tricky topic, which is how to deal with having multiple files in your program. Okay, so there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on here. Um, let me look at my list of things I want to cover. Okay, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to delete all this. I'm going to have um, a variable count here. I'm going to have a function called counter. And I'm going to say count plus plus. So I'm basically returning the number of times counter is called. Okay, so let me let me give this a try. I'm just going to actually do 
do it like this. Do this a few times. Okay, so that works as expected. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this, this function over in another file. Okay, so now in addition to main.c, I'm gonna have a helper.c. Okay, and I'm gonna grab this count, as so, and put it over here. Okay, and of course now I have to build this a little bit differently. I also have to say helper.c, so I can build that. And it's trying to tell me that there's an implicit declaration of counter. Um, and that's basically because, again, main is looking forward in this file, not seeing anything. So just like before, I can have, um, I can have, oops, let me just grab it from helper.c. I can have my function prototype as before, and this will make c, ha um, c happy within the main function. Okay, so one, two, three, um, just like before, that's all good. <clears throat> Let me show you, when we start to build big projects like this, maybe, I guess this isn't a big project, but you can imagine if I had hundreds or thousands of the files, it would be. I probably don't want to recompile all these files every time. If I only change one file, I'd like to just change that and not have to recompile all the others. Um, so what we can do is we can partially compile these guys um, as so. So let me... I can compile, so I'm going to use C instead of O since I'm doing an intermediate file, and I can do that, and if I do an ls, I see I have main.o, and I can compile the other one, which is helper.c, and then I see I also have helper.o, and then what I can finally do is I can compile them all together, and so I may say if I'm going to compile these to main, I want main.o and helper.o, and now I can run that as before. So what you see here is that I basically had to run multiple commands to build these, and I don't want to run all of these every time. I want to, if, if anything changes, I have to run this last one, but if only helper changes, I should be able to rerun this one without rerunning that one, okay? So there's a tool called make that takes a make file and handles these situations. So I'm gonna create a make file here. It's gonna be called um, make file with a capital M. And the way makefile works is that you can put all these commands in here and, and basically tell it dependency so it knows when to run these things. So I'm first just going to copy all of these uh, all of these compile commands over here, <clears throat> as so. And so I have these three commands and it needs to know when to run them. <clears throat> so the first thing you're going to do is you're going to tell, I'm just going to look at this first one by itself for now you first have to tell the make file what it is you're trying to build. So this command is going to build the main.o, and you have to tell it when it should rebuild that. We want to rebuild it when main.c changes. So we're basically, um, we're basically saying, I should put a tab there. So main.c is going to depend on these things. Oops. And let me actually just get rid of these for now. So that's good. Okay, so it's going to build the first one when any of these other ones change. Okay, and this is a tab here. It wants to have tabs. I bet it, I could actually have some spaces here instead and it'll be just as happy. Oh, nope, it needs to have a tab actually. Okay, and so similarly for this one, um, what we want to build is we want to build helper uh, o and that's going to depend on, and I think I actually need it like that instead. Sorry about the syntax there. Okay, that's going to be depend on helper, um, helper.c. And then finally, <coughs> if I want to rebuild uh, main, um, that's going to depend on these other files, the O files. And when I want to link all those together, I'll do that with this final command here. Okay. So make is fine. And you see when I run it though, it's saying make.o is up to date. What it's really doing is it's looking for the first, first command in this file, and it's or the first um, resource in this file and trying to build that. So what I could do is I could say make main, and that would actually do what I want. It's, build, it's building the proper thing. Um, if I want to do this one by default, I can put this up on the top. And of course, you see it's not actually building it because it says it's up to date, but let me show you again. 
So one thing we can do is we can um, have a clean function. So when these things don't necessarily have to be actual actual file names, you can also <coughs> give these labels where it'll just run it um, no matter what, as long as you don't have a file called that. So in this case, I'm going to remove all the O files and main. So if I run make clean, that's good. If I run make, it will rebuild all my all my resources. Okay. So as you start building more complex files. Uh, you're going to be using these make files, and that's a useful thing to get familiar with because these will get much more complex. Okay, so let's head back to our code, main.c. So main.c is doing this. One of the things that um, is tricky is how to deal with private and public variables in C because uh, it's frankly strange because like the, the, the keywords they use to denote that um, are not something like private and public, it's much less intuitive. So by default, things are going to be <clears throat> our things are going to be public in C. So when I have this helper.c over here, this is actually public. And what that means is if I do something like this, count equals zero, I'll have it equal something else. And I try to make this, I'm actually going to get an error. And I get an error in my linker because the du it's a duplicate symbol across these two files. They both have the count, uh, the count variable. So how do I do that? I need to make them private. To make them private in C, I say static. And, and keep in mind that static means something else uh, if it's inside of a function. But for these variables that are outside of any function, I'm saying that it's private to main.c. And I also, I actually made this read-only here. And I also want to say static inside of helper.c. So I'm going to do that here. And now these will be private variables. So I can run this. And it's unhappy because this is actually unused, because it's a different variable. So I'm going to say here now, um, I'm actually going to say both my local counter and my shared one. So I'm going to say this other counter as well. Okay, so the first one is trying to print off is trying to be the counter in helper.c, and the second one will be my own counter. And I should probably do something like this too. Okay, so I'm going to make that. And why is it unhappy right now? It's unhappy because I'm, I'm saying counter instead of count. So I'm, I'm looking to use my local variable here. Maybe it would be even more intuitive if I used a name like x instead of something like count. So I'm going to just use, use x in both of these. OK, so I replace that everywhere. And actually, I didn't want to do that. That find and replace is bad. OK, so I'm using x here. Using x here, let's build this. And actually, I should. Uh, Replace count here as well. Okay, so let me build that. And finally, I have, have something that works here. So let me now run my main program. And sure enough, I see that these two x's are different. The, the x in helper.c keeps changing, and then the, the x in main.c stays the same. So because I'm using static in both of these cases, these are both private variables. Okay? So, <clears throat> um, there are other cases where maybe I want to make these the same, and I actually do want it to be global shared across files, but I want multiple files to be able to access it. So remember, if I did this, what happens? It complains because I have duplicate symbols. So what I want to do is I want to make it public in one of these, and by making it public, I don't really do anything. And in the other one, I want it to refer to other file. So I'm going to make it public here over in helper.c by leaving it as it is. And over here, I can say, hey, I'm not actually defining x here. I just want to use the, the x in the other file. Okay, so let me try this now. And so this should work as normal. Well, actually, um, it'll work as normal, normal and they'll both be in sync. So let me build this. And it should, they should both say one, two, three. And of course now, since this is extern, I can modify it from here. So when I say, let's say I want to start at 100, really what I'm doing is I'm modifying the x and helper.c because I have 
have an extern in main.c. Okay, so I build that and run, and, it, and sure enough, it starts at 100. Okay. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about header files. So I'm going to show you a mistake people make sometimes when they're trying to share variables between different files. So often people, let's say you have a struct and you want to share that between different C files, you might put that in the same header file. When you do that same thing with, uh, with a variable, things can go badly. So let me have, uh, I'm going to have something called common.h. And in header.h, we're going to put an int x equals 0. And then I'm going to get rid of that in main.c. Get rid of it in helper.c. And then I'm going to actually, I forgot to include another one. I'm going to make it include, um, include it in both of these. I'm going to say common.h, like so. And also in main.c, I'm going to include this. Okay, so let's build this. Do a make. And sure enough, there's a problem. It says duplicate symbol. The duplicate symbol is x. It's in both main.o and helper.o. So what happened here? Uh, let me go back and run this command so I can see what the preprocessor is doing on each of these. So I see that above main, it's injecting an int x. And that's because when I include this common.h, it's looking in the local local directory since it's in quotes, and it's basically taking common.h and dumping it right here. Okay, and let's look at now helper.c, and we see the exact same thing, it's dumping x in. So because both main.c and helper.c include common.h, they both get dumped uh, with that x. So we can't do that. So we really have to go back to having having like we did before, where we had x in one of them, and we had in main.c, we just had an x turn into x. Okay, and then I can't really put that in common.h. Got it. So let me compile this and make sure the code is good. And sure enough, it is. All right, so. There's one last uh, pattern I want to show you when we're talking about how to do multiple files. And the situation we might end up with is that in these common files, maybe we'll include, it's possible for one fi uh, common file to include another common file. So I'm going to say uh, common 2.h, or I should say it's, com it's pop possible for one header file to include another header file. So I'm going to modify this. And let's say, for example, there's some struct here. Um, we'll say uh, struct chord again. Actually, I'm going to do the type def struct chord uh, as so, and x and y. And so the problem we can run into is that when we have um, kind of chained includes like this, maybe I want to include both of these for whatever reason in my main.c. And what will happen is when I try to build this, I'm going to get that duplicate error message again. Okay, so it says type def redefinition with um, with the chord T. And that's because when the common includes it, common includes common 2, which has it, and then common 2 also has it. So let me just one more time, I'm going to do, look at the preprocessor with GCC. And I see, sure enough, this struct is getting included twice. Okay. So the solution here is not to say, hey, you have to be very careful about what you include in case somebody's done it before, because that gets hairy to keep track of. Um, what we have to do is we have to make sure, we have to modify common2.h ourselves so that that code only ever gets dumped somewhere once. So I'm going to show you a very common design pattern that you'll see in C, where what we're going to do is we're going to say, uh, if not defined, and then we'll say something here that kind of looks like the file name. So if it's not defined, then we're going to define it. And then I'm going to put an end if down here. So what will happen here is we'll, we'll, as the preprocessor is reading this code for this include here, it'll read through here and say, is this defined? And of course it's not. We haven't defined it anywhere. Uh, then we'll immediately define it. It'll dump in this code and so on. And then the next time it gets imported, um, so I think we imported it once indirectly through here, and now we're importing it directly through here. It'll say, is it defined? And it'll say it is. So if not defined, well, it won't 
actually dump any of this code, so it'll only do it once. So if we have this if not defined pattern, uh, just like this, we'll end up with exactly one copy of our code. And sure enough, it works fine. Okay, so that is uh, the end of most of the stuff I want to show you with C. I also want to show you just a little bit um, in GDB. I'm just, there's a lot of features in GDB that you can use to debug. I'm just going to show you one thing today, and that is how to identify what line of your program is causing a seg fault. So to do that, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to create a seg fault. Um, how am I going to do that? I'm going to maybe make a, a function that says, uh, we'll say increment, and maybe that will take a pointer to x, and let's just say x, let's say we'll increase it by 1. Okay. So now, now down here I can say I'll have my value and I'll increment it. And then I'll print my value. Actually, I don't want to really compile all these things together anymore. So I'll go back to this. Main, and then main.c. Do that, and then I run it, and somehow it magically... Oh, it magically works because I actually passed a reasonable value. Let's pass it, or let's do something even a little bit more unreasonable. Let's do something like this. Um, I'll initialize that. Okay, so now this should be unhappy because I'm passing in null to increment. Um, so this should crash when it runs. I run it. And sure enough, there's a seg fault. So if we want to debug this, we actually have to do, do, um, first compile it with an extra flag. The extra flag is G. So we'll do that. I'm just trying to run GDB on my binary. And actually, it's silly, but on a Mac, I have to run sudo for that. And now I just run run. I get the seg fault. And I want to see what causes this. I'm going to do BT for backtrace. And I see line 7 of main.c called to line 12, and that was where my seg fault was. Actually, it was opposite. Line 12 called to line c, and so it basically had my problem in increment on line c, 7 of main.c. So let me head over there, and I'm going to jump to line 7, and sure enough, that's where my seg fault is, and of course, it told me that this was caused by line 12 where I passed it. So that's how you use GDB.